This feels like a great honour. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me at the back, Will? Yes. Excellent. Now, if you can't hear me at the back later on, can you wave, Will? Or Abigail? Or Simon? I don't know anyone else. But if you can't hear me, please wave. My name's Andrew Armstrong. I'm the city archaeologist at Gloucester City Council. And I'm going to remember how to operate this. Hold on. Yes! That's encouraging. So, um, let me gather my thoughts. I'm going to speak today about a number of different projects, some of which are part of the High Street Heritage Action Zone, some of which are funded through the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, and some of which have been secured through the NPPF. So a bit of a mix. Um, it's not a rolling story of success. There are a lot of learning curves. So this is not necessarily how to do things. This is where Andrew and colleagues got things wrong and where some of Andrew's colleagues got things right and everything in between. Um, a bit about Gloucester. I don't actually have a map showing you where Gloucester is, but I assume you can Google that if, if you desperately need to know. It's in the west of England. Gloucester um, is probably the most important archaeological site in the southwest of England, said the city archaeologist. Um, <laughs> no, no, hear me out, hear me out. It, it's got everything from Paleolithic to Bronze Age and then almost continuous settlement activity from the late Iron Age to the present day. Roman Fort, Colonia, Mercy and Burr, um, medieval and royal town centre, civil war defences, industrial archaeology. It's got everything. And it's currently going through a major phase of regeneration, probably the greatest amount of regeneration in Gloucester since the 1970s, which is why I'm going grey. So um, these are some of the current regeneration sites that are happening in the city. I'm not going to talk you through them all because they're nice and brightly coloured and you can just spot them. Um, but as well as the regeneration sites, there's also the High Street Heritage Action Zone, which is there in orange, which is essentially Gloucester's Westgate Street, which is referred to as the Cathedral Quarter High Street Heritage Action Zone. I don't know why it's referred to as the Cathedral Quarter High Street Heritage Action Zone, but it does sound lovely. So um, a lot's going on and a lot of opportunities for projects that promote our understanding of the city, promote... Public ownership. My lanyard. Yeah. I do apologise. Um, there we go. Is that better? Splendid. So a lot going on, a lot of opportunities for projects that improve people's experience of Gloucester, appreciation of its heritage, and that contribute to Gloucester's economy. Um, I'm going to talk today about some projects we've com completed over the last few years. I'm going to go on to talk about some projects that are currently underway and then I'm going to finish up with some aspirations for the future. So, just looking back in time, this is actually before I was city archaeologist. This is in the crazy days of 2011, and this is on a site in Gloucester called Greyfriars. And this is a community excavation being run by Cotswold Archaeology, funding secured via a Section 106 agreement, um, which was effectively an evaluation, really. And it found some really cool archaeology. It found the cloister of the nearby... Greyfriars Church, it engaged lots of members of the public, and it was followed up with a public talk. Um, and after that, really, there wasn't really anything developing from that that affected the actual development. There was a public space in the general area of the cloister, but that was accidental. Now, when I got into post, I was engaged in a number of other community projects. This is a site called St. Mary de Crypt Church on Southgate Street in Gloucester, which was the site of a heritage lottery funded project to regenerate the church and adjacent schoolroom into a uh, publicly usable space. And um, we did the traditional thing. We had an evaluation on the site, which was run as a community evaluation. So members of the public dug test pits under the careful um, tutorial supervision of Avon archeology, span and they found lots of archeology span and it was all very good. And then when they got planning permission, um, which included lowering the floor level within the old schoolroom, school we went back and we did a community excavation, and we dropped the floor level, and again, they found lovely things, and it was all very good, and lots of people had a lot of fun. I have to say, this is a great place to do a community dig. It's indoors, it has lights, and it has a toilet next door. <laughs> Boom. And we did the traditional thing again, and I, 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 we're moving through this to more exciting stuff, so just, just hold on. Um, and we worked with Discover to Crypt, who are the organization who run the church, to produce um, displays and information about the stuff the archaeologists had find, found. And you would have seen this before. And 
talking about things that are found by archaeologists that affect the design of the development. Here we find the late medieval drain running along the edge of St. Mary de Crypt Church, which predates the later schoolroom. And this was found, and it was then preserved in situ and displayed within the schoolroom itself, which is fine. It's, it's even quite good. It's not possibly the most exciting part of the city's history I would have gone for, but, you know, it's a lovely bit of detail, and it does demonstrate the chronology quite well. That's just something I found exciting. Now, when we were digging the sewer connection out front of St. Mary's Crypt Church, not me, when I say we, I mean I, the royal we, um, the archaeologists from Avon did manage to spot a Roman altar top, which is rather beautiful, and a really massive piece of uh, Roman stonework from a cornice. That one's upside down. It's about 40 centimetres wide, but it's a metre deep. Rather splendid. And um, those are both now conserved and being stored at the museum. But the aspiration as part of the next National Lottery Heritage Funded project at Decrypt is to display those on loan from the museum at Decrypt. They quite like it because it's religious. And they, they can easily segue that into their theme of worship on the site. Brilliant, you know, exactly what we're trying to do. Get stuff out of the museum, into the community where people can see it. The museum at Gloucester is wonderful, but it is full. Anyone's museum not full? <laughs> we'll be sending you stuff. Um, so one of the things we've been working with partners on in a lot of places is talking about where we can display heritage outside of the museum in partnership sites. Another National, Lot National Lottery Heritage Funded site, this is Lantony Priory which is on the left, red circle there. Um, big project to put the Priory into sustainable use in partnership with Gloucester College, which is next door, um, overseen by the Lantony Secunda Priory Trust. And uh, very successful. The project included lots of archaeology, as you might imagine, um, lots of interesting finds, which are on display at the Priory, and lots of aspirations to work in partnership with our museum to display more of the archive on site get it out of the boxes in the museum, get it on display to the public, make it all a bit more meaningful. Um, and on the right, joint working with the cathedral as part of their National Lottery funded Project Pilgrim, where the cathedral was landscaping the cloister of Gloucester Cathedral down 50 centimetres. And the consultants in the room will laugh because I told them not to landscape in a cemetery. 200 inhumations later, I'll just work here. But we've got classic information boards up around the excavation, which also provided a bit of protection for the human remains, and we did lots of public engagement as well. All very traditional so far. So this is a bit more of an MPPF one, and this represented a bit of a, a development for me, because we've been doing National Lottery Community Archaeology up until this point, and this came along in 2014. This is the site... Well, this is how it's going to look. This is the former site of Gloucester Prison. Does anyone know Gloucester Prison? It's always nice to check. Someone always <laughs> shoots their hand up. And, um, well, anyway, this is Gloucester Prison as it's going to be, a glorious residential development, shining beacon of um, uh, affluent lifestyle in Gloucester city centre. Um, and it was, originally, the site of Gloucester's second castle. Gloucester had two castles. It had the, the old castle... What was the other castle called? Anyone? The new castle. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is not a dynamic audience. Um, the new castle. And this is the site of the new castle, which is 12th century and not really very new anymore. Um, and on the right, yes, that's your right, isn't it, is a map from the late 18th century which shows the, the keep of Gloucester Castle, which... The. So, we have a site coming up for development which was the site of a castle. And again, the consultants in the room will be, their blood will be running cold at this point. Now, there is no longer a standing castle on the site, so there was a bit of a debate about what might be there. Now, I am going to do a lot of archaeological backstory here, so if anyone isn't interested in archaeology, have a nap, check your phones, leave, I don't mind. Um, but anyway, we, we had lots of archaeological and historical studies of the site, which uh, we took, and then we overlaid using our superlative GIS skills onto a modern map. And we came away with the conclusion that the keep of Gloucester Castle ought to be under the prison basketball court, here. And we also had some photos from the 1980s. In 1985, 
This is a photograph taken, ooh, back, don't spoil it. <laughs> this is a photograph taken when the Ministry of Justice were just ripping it up some new foundations on the site, and these are beautiful 13th century stonework about to have concrete poured on them, to which we say boo, don't we? <laughs> boo, boo, no, no. That was good, we nearly had some participation, that was splendid. <laughs> So we evaluated the site, and I'd had a wonderful discussion with a consultant beforehand who said, Andrew, the castle's gone. It's been destroyed. Move on. Can you see the castle keep? <laughs> there it is. Can you see it now? Three meters wide, 12th century Norman construction. They don't, they don't do subtle, the Normans, they're just big. Massed wall construction, 60 centimeters below the tarmac. Here it is in plan. Glorious. There we go. I don't know how you top finding a castle. And here's some people from Cotswold Archaeology stood on the wall. This is the internal facing of the wall. And this was very good, and I wasn't smug at all. <laughs> but this only gave us two corners of the keep, and that didn't allow us to define its extent and ensure that it was protected going forward. So we dug another trench here. This is actually inside the sports hall of the prison. Anyone familiar with the Gloucester Prison Sports Hall? <laughs> no? It's uh, one day. And that was a lovely place to put a trench. This had lighting, this building, and a flushing toilet next door. You see a theme in Gloucester. We, we, all our archaeology is near a flushing toilet. And here's Dan from Cotswold Archaeology. Dan is a real archaeologist. He has a beard. He is... Actually, that's not fair. Ignore that comment. Um, but here we are. And here is Dan stood on the wall of Gloucester Castle Keep. We know that the northwest wall of Gloucester Castle Keep was, in fact, well, it fell down. Um, it's very um, Monty Python, you know, it fell down and they built another one. And they repair the northwest wall in the 14th century. And here we have what we believe to be that later repair um, sat on the earlier wall footings, treating them as a foundation. Really splendid. 20 centimetres below the concrete. So we came away, this is my awful sketching with GIS, which I apologise, but we came away with a keep which is, in fact, quite big, quite big and quite intact. And it falls under the nationally important heritage asset bit where I have to start getting very pushy and saying, we have to preserve it in situ, you know. Um, now, what was really interesting is the rest of the castle around it, because it was looted much earlier by the good people of Gloucester, survived much worse. It was two meters depth before you found archeology span anywhere else. So we had a chat with the developers and talked about how they could design their scheme to leave the keep alone. And they came up with something broadly like this, which was entirely acceptable. We're very reasonable and proportionate in Gloucester, and we, we find a way. Um, I'm being filmed, aren't I, so I have to say that. Um, now, initially, they were going to have this area as a car park. Now, you see, some of the consultants are in the room going, yeah, I can see that working. I saw you there, Abigail. Um, I pointed out to the developers that having a car park on, on top of the castle might not be the message we want to send for modern regeneration in Gloucester, using our heritage to, to create that unique identifier. And with a bit of thinking, they agreed with that. And it was decided that we would have the castle keep as a public space, glorious, archaeology informing the design, just what we want here, people. And we came up with this concept. Well, I didn't. They, someone much better paid than me came up with this concept. And essentially, we were going to have the castle keep as a public space. And within that public space, the intention is to have a viewing chamber here, which will show that section of the castle wall I showed you where Dan was stood, which would um, then allow members of the public to see the castle wall, and then the castle wall itself would be interpreted on the ground using landscaping. And we would condition the landscaping. We have a condition for the landscaping, and we have a condition for the viewing chamber as well and we have to approve the design of those, and the management of the viewing chamber falls under the management plan for the site going forward. And that permission has been granted, and it is, has been partly implemented, but there is a massive heritage deficit going forward on this site. Um, not all because of the fact there's a castle underneath it. There are lots of big listed buildings as well. But as a scheme, it has consent, it has permission, and it is waiting to be implemented. It hasn't happened yet, but I remain optimistic but hopefully a really good example within the MPPF of where archaeology, the discoveries of archaeological remains at the evaluation stage can inform design. So, moving on. 
I'm going to briefly talk about the High Street Heritage Action Zone in Gloucester, which, as I've already said, is the orange stretch of Gloucester. Oh, goodness, I haven't even... Oh, my heavens. Right, I'm going to speed up. Basically, um, at our launch event for the High Street Heritage Action Zone, we commissioned lots of 3D art showing the archaeological remains beneath Gloucester. Um, and this was all about trying to promote people to visiting the city centre and getting them to learn also about the archaeology beneath their feet. And there's a, a perilous picture of me stood on the Roman city walls uh, for the amusement of the public. And there's my colleague Claire staring down at a uh, Roman bathhouse which is in the wrong place. But that's fine. And we then came back a year later. I should add that this got lots of footfall and a huge amount of public interest and was very popular. We came back a year later, and there's my colleague Natasha on the Gloucester Cross, which again is in the wrong place. We couldn't fit it on the actual cross because of logistics and you know fire brigade access and things, but hey. And this was all very popular. And the last one, Civil War Defensive Earthwork, again in the wrong place due to building work, but hey. <laughs> so that was all very cool. Um, and one of the things we've been thinking about is how we engage children. And this is a to-scale reconstruction of the Roman Forum at Gloucester, as it would have looked in the second century AD if it was made out of Lego. <laughs> and uh, I had to write a brief for this, and then we went out to tender. It was a very strange experience. <laughs> this isn't finished yet, but this will be on display at the Archaeology Festival in July, and I'm going to spend a week trapped in a room with it, talking to the general public. And this is Westgate Street, as it would have looked in the medieval period, and we have a third display as well. All awfully good. Um, a bit opportunistic, there was central government funding available. It was going to run out at the end of the year. We took it and ran with it. Why not? Um, and hopefully this will encourage people to think about the city centre, to think about Westgate Street, and um, to learn about their past. Because I'm running out of time, I'm going to have to speed up. So the next site I'm going to talk about is the Gloucester bus station, I really meant to call it the transport hub, located on the outskirts of Gloucester. Um, there was a bit of a design problem at one point where I didn't realize an intercept tank for the bus station would be quite deep. And I blame myself and the consultants involved. <laughs> and here's Chris with the resulting Roman building we then found in the really deep hole. Um, and more pictures of Roman building. And eventually we worked out that the Roman building or buildings occupied broadly the space although this is an interpretation. We're very lucky in Gloucester in that we have a local artist and historian who likes doing archaeological historic reconstructions. So um, I approached him and asked him if he was willing to uh, produce a reconstruction drawing of how the Roman building may have looked. And he very kindly agreed. And we then put this up in the bus station itself, a very traditional way of doing things. Um, now, my colleagues had the idea of putting the stonework from the Roman building in there as well, the stonework we had to remove. Now, if I'd been asked, I would have said, let's number it and let's take it apart carefully and then reconstruct it as it would have looked. Just draw a pole. Who thinks that looks like cladding? <laughs> no one. Oh, just me then. Thank heavens. That's all right. But yeah, just popping back to that, lovely piece of interpretation. Hasn't been vandalized yet. All to the good. Now, I was speaking about my, our lo tame local historian and artist. After that development, he then sent me all his artwork. And it turned out he had 40 reconstruction drawings of the city. And I foolishly responded to him saying, wouldn't it be great if we could take your reconstruction drawings, pair them with the archaeological evidence, and make a book about them? He said, great idea. When can we start? And last year, we produced, on behalf of the Gloucester History Festival, this, which is called Gloucester Recreating the Past. There's me grinning like an idiot with the artist Phil. And we produced this book, All Proceeds to the History Festival, which talk about reconstruction, which talk about the history of Gloucester using archaeological evidence from historic excavations and present excavations. I won't, I won't talk about that for very long because I'm running out of time, but it was great fun, and it raised some money for the History Festival itself. I'm nearly there. This site is King Square in Gloucester. It, is being, it has finished being redeveloped and re-landscaped. The issue in King Square was that it formed part of a tour guides route called the Via Sacra, which the Civic Trust used to um, teach people about the history of Gloucester. And it follows broadly the walls of the Roman city. Problem is, those, this is what it looks like on, on the ground. 
And the problem is that needed to be removed. So a decision was made to replace the Via Sacra with way markers, which would indicate the route more subtly. Uh, that was the plan. Now, the artist who got working on this uh, particular project decided that Roman was good for Gloucester and um, wanted to use examples of recently discovered artifacts in Gloucester. This is a, a Roman wing found about three years ago and an inkwell found about four years ago. And uh, with those, she produced this design, um, which ended up being installed as the route markers along the northern and eastern side of King Square. And that's what it looks like on the ground. So that is, there's our archaeological form uh, finds informing a design. I've got to admit, I think it's pretty impenetrable to someone who doesn't know what it is, personally. But it looks nice, and maybe the SIP Trust can explain what it is to people. Um, there we go. I'm nearly there. I'm scooting through these now. This is the King's Court of Redevelopment, where we have a, uh, a culvert being redirected through a Carmelite friary and a Roman suburb, like you do. And we have some rather interesting artifacts. This is the Venus de Gluven, which is, uh, I don't know what to say, really, apart from wow. Um, and we were approached by a TV company about this development. And we decided that this might be an opportunity to get some positive press about the redevelopment site and to reach a wider audience about Gloucester's heritage. So um, here's me talking about the archaeological works on site discussing Carmelites with a Carmelite historian from Kent, a very lovely man called Roger. And we produced this, which was called Whitefriars, the Lost Priory of Gloucester. It wasn't really lost. We, we had maps. Um, and from the archaeological and historical evidence, we then produced some wireframe layouts of how the Priory might have looked. And um, I can justify these, but it would take 45 minutes, an entirely separate talk. And ultimately, the film that they produced, the documentary that they produced, had these rather snazzy fly-throughs that showed how the Carmelite Friary may have looked in the middle of the 13th century, uh, 14th century. And it was all very pleasing, to be honest. Um, that went out on the History Hits channel, and it had apparently 10,000 views. So that was reaching a wide public audience, and it got lots of very positive feedback. And it was largely accurate, <laughs> largely. Um, you can watch it for free. You, you don't have to pay. You can sign in. and the, yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing is, we then had these wire frames left over from the production. And we engaged with the developer, Reef, to talk about how those wire frames could be finessed, improved, and then potentially used on on-site interpretation. So this is a mock-up, but the idea being that um, we could place three of these around the site, showing different views of how the Carmelite Friary may have looked. And those could be um, attached to QR codes, which could then give you more information. Comme ça. So I've gone over time, I think. But um, lots going on, lots of ideas, not all of them successful.